the story changes a little bit in 2000. And since 2000, gentrification sort of, sort of falls off the table as, a, as an important predictor. Instead, it's replaced by race. And here, what, what, I, what I measured was the racial profile of public housing compared to the racial profile of the city. And in those cities where the racial profile of public housing was disproportionately African American compared to the city as a whole, those were the cities tearing down the most public housing, where it had become racially identified. Why the change? I think, you know, in 1990, it was still new to tear down public housing. It was still uh, a kind of a, a new and different thing to do. Once it had become accepted, uh, it was adopted by, uh, by cities with, that just didn't want uh, public housing anymore in, in, in those cities where I, as I said before, it had been uh, racially identified. The other, thing I, oops, the other thing I know here is that politics actually has something, uh, some uh, role in this. In, in cities where there's a greater progressive housing movement, fewer units of public housing uh, were torn down. So there's some evidence here that, that, that politics does uh, uh, can work and, and, and pressure uh, can work to, uh, to uh, limit the the second question I ask is, even within cities that are very active in tearing down their public housing, they don't often tear down all of their public housing. So the question is, which units come down and which ones are safe? And the question I ask is, is there a disproportionate impact on people of color from the units that are torn down versus the units that are safe? Now, in some respects, there's always going to be a disproportionate impact on people of color, no matter what you do to public housing, because people of color are disproportionately living in public housing across the country. African Americans, uh, less than 15% of our nation's population, are nevertheless 48% of public housing nationwide. When you take a look at just the largest housing authorities, the largest cities, African Americans are two thirds of those living in public housing. I had data, or I, re I restricted my analysis to the largest US cities and looked at 305 different demolitions there. And in those cities, African Americans made up 79.5% of, uh, of the residents of public housing. But that still doesn't, we still don't know exactly whether that's disproportionate. So what I did was I analyzed each and every demolition. And I'm gonna run you quickly through an example of how I did it. The example I'm using is a place called Vernal Dwellings in San Francisco. It was torn down in 1997. It had 208 units of public housing. The year before it was torn down, only 93% of the units were occupied. And of those units that were occupied, 69% were occupied by African Americans torn down the next year. Compared to all public housing in San Francisco, however, only 49% of all public housing in San Francisco was occupied by African Americans. Okay, 69% in Vernon Dwelling. So that's what I did for all 305 of the demolitions. I looked at who lived in those units compared to who lived in the rest of public housing in that city that year. The answer that I came up with was what happened in Vernal Dwellings was happening in a lot of places. St. Clair Village in, in Pittsburgh, Lonsdale Homes in Knoxville, Tennessee. You can see the list uh, up there. The George B. Murphy Homes in Baltimore were 99% African American. Uh, the rest of the public housing in Baltimore was 92% African American. Uh, Curtis Park Homes in Denver it was torn down, it was only 61% African American. That's not overly much, unless you compare it to the rest of public housing in Denver that year, which was only 25% African American. The Arapaho Courts homes in Denver, 65% African American. The rest of the city's public housing, only 25%, and on and on and on. And you can find examples, you can find counter examples. You can find some places that were torn down that had fewer African Americans than the rest. But when you look at them all, 
net of all other factors, net of the conditions of the unit, net of whether these units were occupied by seniors, net of vacancy rates, net of income, race was a significant predictor of which public housing projects have been torn down over the last 20 years. And so I think that when you combine that finding with the finding that I, uh, that I discussed before at the city level, I think you have to conclude that the demolition of public housing in the United States has unfolded as part of a racial strategy Perhaps not an overt conscious strategy, but a, a racial strategy to re-image large parts of American cities and to change uh, the, the racial profile. And it has, at the very least, triggered a forced mobilization of people of color and of the poor out of very large swaths of American uh, inner cities. So um, my book tries to document that. Uh, again, uh, this unweighted disparity ratio means that when you look at public housing that's torn down, it has on average 10% more African Americans living in it than you would have predicted had there been an even distribution of race across demolished. Uh, my book also documents uh, what I regard as the disappointing fate uh, for most relocated uh, public housing residents. Uh, I took a look at the desire to move and the desire to stay. What, does the, what do the studies show about whether people really wanted to move? And make no mistake about it, some people wanted to move out of their public housing. Some people welcomed the demolition of public housing, but not all of them. And in fact, most of the studies show that it's about an even split. Uh, anywhere from 45 to 65 in, in one direction or another, but a pretty even split between those who desire to move and those who desire to stay. But the, the, the research also shows what percentage wanted to move back to their newly redeveloped units and what percentage actually got to move back. And in fact, most of the research shows that it's about one in five people who ever return to those redeveloped sites to live brand new mixed income developments that the housing authorities and that the developers were talking to them about uh, in terms of what their neighborhood would look like. And so uh, people always ask me for a summary of, well, did it work? Did it work for, for residents or not? And, uh, and uh, it's, you know, I find it almost impossible it took me about a year to figure out a quick way of answering that. And the quick way of answering is the following. Some liked it, some didn't. And some liked some of it and didn't like other ones. And some liked it some of the time, <laughs> but didn't like it other ones of the time. And all of those are absolutely accurate uh, in terms of, of, uh, of what we know about what happened uh, to folks. For some people, they liked it, they landed on their feet, and they're thankful for it. For other people, it was a disaster. Some people liked it when you when you interview them three months afterwards, didn't like it so much a year and three months afterwards. Or vice versa. And some of it, and some of the people liked some things about the move and certain others. And uh, but by no means can you uh, look at this and uh, and say that this has been an unqualified and universal uh, success. For the residents uh, themselves. Um, and finally, what I look at is what happens to the neighborhoods where this kind of public housing transformation is taking place. And so I looked at a lot of different public housing developments, and I just measured two different things about what was happening in the na those neighborhoods. I I measured whether the neighborhoods were were experiencing an increase in their African American population or a decrease in their African-American population. So we're, what was the racial profile of the surrounding neighborhoods changing? Uh, and there you see that axis, right? And then the other one is the axis, the extent of poverty. Did poverty change in those neighborhoods? Did it decline or did it increase? And where those two dimensions meet, right in the middle there, that's the status quo. That's no change at all, right? No change in race, no change 
and then you can sort of label each of those categories. So where there is a, a no change or an increase in African American population, but a decline in poverty, you could call that black gentrification. And that's happened in a couple of places. Uh, this quadrant over here is white gentrification, where the neighborhood changes in terms of reduction of poverty, but it also switches from predominantly white to, uh, sorry, predominantly black to predominantly white. Uh, and over here is a bunch of dots representing pub actual public housing projects. And this location right here is the status quo. So we're really only looking at this lower left quadrant. You can see a lot of units in the black gentrification uh, area. You can see a lot of units, though, in the white gentrification area as well. And then you can see some developments where no change has taken place. Uh, it's impossible to, uh, to summarize neatly about what's happened to the neighborhoods. In fact, all sorts of different things have happened uh, to the neighborhoods. Um, all right, so what have residents been doing uh, uh, about this, and what have community organizations been doing about it? There has been some resistance on the part of public housing residents and uh, a little bit from the communities surrounding public housing. And, uh, and so you've gotten the, the creation of, of coalitions of organizations that have been uh, working on behalf of residents, sometimes suing local housing authorities to stop demolitions, sometimes protesting. We've seen this, of course, in Chicago, New Orleans, we've seen it in Seattle, we've seen it in, uh, in lots of different uh, cities. One thing that the residents have tried to do is to replace that discourse of disaster that I talked about earlier with a different discourse. Talking about public housing, uh, for example, as homes, as a community, as places where they have raised families, where they have lived for years, uh, and, uh, and to talk about it as a place uh, where, they, um, where they benefited from the social support networks uh, and the communities that they uh, that they lived in, and so you see uh, uh, you see residents, uh, and you see this in films that have been made. You see you see this in oral histories that have been taken of uh, residents trying to convince the rest of the world that this was a place that you could live. This was a community, uh, and it's worth preserving. And that, not only that, but that they love living uh, in this house. Again, not universally, but significantly so. The second element of this counter, uh, this, this discourse of resistance, is to, is to call out the fact that a lot of the decline and neglect of public housing was not necessary. That it was, in some cases, and in the worst cases, Reduced by local housing authorities, or at least allowed by local officials and, uh, and housing authorities. And these, these uh, quotes uh, come from people who um, are reacting to the demolition of their housing and reacting to the, uh, the Hope 6 proposals that they read uh, and the characterizations of those units. Um, and, and they don't recognize their own units in the characterization of them. And finally, they argue that, you know, the demolition of public housing just doesn't make sense as housing policy. We are in an era where housing needs are as acute as they have ever been. And we are tearing down the most affordable portion of our, of our assisted housing system. And it just doesn't uh, make sense. And, uh, and you, you can look at waiting lists for public housing that are thousands uh, in some cities. Uh, you can uh, document the seven or the eight million families in the United States that face what HUD calls worst case housing needs. That number has increased 18% since the year 2000. Waiting lists growing. The accounts of, of Atlanta, Georgia, outside of Atlanta a couple of summers ago where 30,000 people waited in the heat and the sun just to sign up for the waiting list for uh, uh, housing. 62 people were hurt 
uh, uh, some were hospitalized. Uh, uh, police were in riot gear to control the crowd. Same thing happened in Dallas. 5,000 people uh, were said to have, quote, stampeded the local housing authority uh, on the day that the waiting list was open. This is happening around the country, around the country, and it's happening in cities that are simultaneously tearing down public housing. So it doesn't really seem to make sense as public housing uh, as well. And we're doing it uh, in, in a way that uh, essentially neglects options. Uh, neglects the options of rehabilitating uh, public housing. Uh, public housing that is mostly functional, that might need some modernization. Uh, and you can find examples of successful rehab modernization of public housing all over the country. This is one close to where uh, I live. Uh, this is Foothomes in Memphis, the last family public housing standing in that city. The city wants to demolish it. The residents of public housing have organized against it. They have enlisted the support of uh, faculty and students at the University of Memphis to help them create their own plan for uh, revitalization and rehab. Waterdale Courts, also in Memphis. These were rehab. Do you know why? Elvis lived there as a kid. And again, I'm, I'm not kidding. That's, that's why. But look at her. Those are beautiful. Trumbull Park Homes in Chicago, a city that has demolished or will demolish 20,000 units, um, uh, has some that it's, uh, that it's rehabilitating, and uh, they're operating. Uh, quite nicely. I will, uh, I will finish with a couple of observations and we can open it up for, uh, for questions. I will reiterate my previous point. This is just not good housing policy. It does not make sense in the light of the housing needs that exist uh, in the United States and the difficulty that we face everywhere in building affordable housing. I will note that you know many in this movement to demolish public housing uh, will say that, you know, we just didn't do it right the first time. We built it in these modernist structures and uh, and we know how to do it better now. We, we, we build them in new urbanist ways and we put front porches on them and we bring them to the street and skate, etc. And so, okay, that's all right. But then the question uh, uh, arises, if that's the case, why aren't we building more of it? When you call their bluff on this, they don't have an answer. They're only building this new urbanist public housing when they tear down more public housing. This is a device for retrenching the public housing program. They have no intention of expanding it, no matter what they say about having discovered the good way of doing it. They've had 15 years to expand it, using it, but doing it in a good way. The second thing is these last 20 years, last 40 years, I think, are one extended episode of double jeopardy for most public housing residents. In the worst public housing in the United States, public housing residents were forced to live in near unlivable conditions, ignored by the city administration, uh, under the, uh, uh, under the uh, influence of housing authorities who were either inept or more simply didn't care. And they were forced to endure uh, some of the worst housing conditions uh, that we had in American cities. Now, at this point in time, when the federal government, when local governments are willing to invest millions of dollars in upgrading public housing, what happens to those residents? They get relocated, they get displaced, they get moved to other places other existing public housing, they, they, they're given a Section 8, and, uh, and they find housing. Most of those residents have moved to other highly segregated, high poverty neighborhoods. 20 years, they're, they're, they're forced to live in the worst conditions. When we decide to fix those conditions, they're shuffled off uh, into other neighborhoods. Double check. The third thing is, uh, the misreading, and I would think almost the willful misreading of uh, criticism of public housing. I can't tell you the number of times I've debated uh, people in this movement who uh, will say that this was bad stuff. Some of this stuff was really bad, and the residents thought it was bad. 
Oh yeah, the residents thought it was bad. Nobody knew as well as the residents how bad some of this housing was. But their criticism of housing, of their public housing, was not a call to demolish it. Their preferred solution, in most cases, was to make it little, was to fix it. And so this notion that if you criticize public housing, you have to agree with the demolition is, of course, uh, absurd. And that's, oops, that's the last one, uh, the false choice. That you either have to accept the bad old public housing that we didn't invest in, that we allowed to decline, or you have to accept large-scale demolition and mixed income development, displacement of the poor, and the shuffling of folks off into uh, The interests of residents in this have uh, never been monolithic. Many, as I mentioned, wanted to move out. Many did not want to move out. And, and the way, and, and so I will uh, we'll, uh, finish with this uh, final quote from my book, which is, as long as local housing authorities and HUD officials and policy analysts could point to some residents who wanted to leave, and who welcomed demolition and relocation, then the opposition of other residents could be put aside. In fact, of course, it should have been the other way around. As long as a sizable number of residents wished to remain, then the desire to demolish and set off universal displacement should have been set aside. Those who wanted to leave should have had their moves facilitated, but not at the expense of those who wish to remain. And that's what we've done over the past 20 years uh, in the United States. Thank you. I know that some of you uh, may want to contact me. My email is there. That's my office uh, phone number. But thank you for your attention. Thank you for coming tonight. And I'm glad to uh, take questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. OK. I Microphone here, and I'm happy to come to you to bring you the microphone if you have any questions for our speaker. Please raise your hands, I can come to you. Right. 
schools are bad, where it's violence, where there are no social services or public services, uh, uh, et cetera. And, and the argument is that uh, people, there, there's a sense that people are really just wanting uh, and needing to get out of those environments. And that this is facilitating that movement to better neighborhoods. It's why, why um, HUD has come to call this choice neighborhoods. The notion that, that they want to create places where people uh, uh, and, uh, would choose uh, to live, neglecting the choice that many made uh, to, uh, to remain uh, where they are. Uh, I, uh, and, and so it's, it, it, so the argument is that this is in the best interest of the, of the residents. And, um, uh, and that, uh, and, then the, and then the other part of the answer to that is, is, uh, is the following. There, there, have been, there were two different federal programs that tried to deconcentrate assisted families out of hyper ghettos. One is the Hope Six program, which tore down and redeveloped. The other is a program called the MTO program moving to opportunity. In that program, the only thing that happened is that a resident was given a voucher and, and was able to move up. Right? Nothing happened to the place where they lived. That program was squelched after a year and a half. It was killed by Congress. It was killed because some uh, predominantly white suburban communities didn't want those people moving into their neighborhood. And so they, they, uh, they exerted their leverage and they killed the program. Why was that program killed and not Hope 6? The reason is because Hope 6 has a separate dimension to it. Not only does Hope 6 move poor people out, just like MTO, but it redevelops the place. It creates an opportunity for private sector investment. It has a constituency that that other program does not. That other program was only about improving the lives of poor people. That's not enough to last uh, in the American policy uh, uh, arena. Hope 6 had something else. It had a, 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 a constituency around the redevelopment of that land. Uh, and that's why it's Good afternoon. I actually live in New Orleans uh, prior pre Katrina, so I have seen the Lafitte project and I actually live in Atlanta uh, when the Boeing Housing Project was actually uh, demolished. And this is essentially another form of systemic racism based on um, the data that was proven in terms of over representation of African Americans in these different communities. And it, it seems quite obvious that at the local level and or state levels where these decisions are being made to demolish that people that are sitting at the table don't, don't look like the people in which we have these outside decisions that are being made and we have this inside accountability of, of moving these community, communities forward. So how do we open up the conversation with our local and state and our federal governments to have people at the table making these decisions that look like these people that are actually living in these situations. And I know that you mentioned if you just have a few that are saying, oh, it's bad, and then they, everyone jumps on the bandwagon and, oh, it's bad. However, that's not the majority. So how do we have this type of dialogue in terms of ensuring that people at the table um, making the decisions also reflect and look like the people who are in the community? Right. It's a very good question. That's a good point, um, and uh, I, I uh, hesitate to say that uh, the track record is not uh, an optimistic one. Uh, there are very few places where what you have described uh, has actually occurred. Uh, you know, how do you open up the table? You you force your way in, uh, and and so you, uh, in some places, uh, headway has been made uh, as a result of, of lawsuits. Some places 
there is a disparate impact that needs to be uh, explained or it needs to be uh, changed. I want to get, hi, my name is Michael Casillas. I build affordable housing and market rate housing. And I just want to get your opinion on, on the solution. I, I think about solutions every day. Um, right now, we have a shortage in Austin of, I think it's still, probably is more, 40,000 uh, affordable housing units. We had a bond in 2006 for uh, $55 million, and we were to 2,000 units over the course of seven years. We're about to hopefully vote and approve another $60 million bond, which, according to my calculations, will yield another 2,000 units over the course of seven years. We have an extreme shortage of housing, and if I totally agree with you, we've lost 90% of the African American population in the neighborhood around Rosewood. What we need to do is increase the number of affordable housing units in that neighborhood, and we need to increase the population of African Americans in that neighborhood by recruiting them back into the neighborhood. So I don't want to just preserve 170 units on an acre of land, I want to double that at the very least uh, because there are waiting lists. And so with this land, how would you, what, what have you seen around the country where we can actually increase the number of, of a population in the neighborhood and, um, uh, and increase the number of the lowest income units and do it with no money coming from HUD, no money coming you know, a, a pittance coming from a huge bond that we passed because we would need $16 billion to, just to deliver the 80% AMI housing that there's a shortage of, we probably need more like $50 billion if we wanted to solve the lowest of income housing prices. So tell me just how to get 200 more years. You're even more depressing than I am. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not usually the most depressing person in the world. <laughs> So, uh, because what you say is, is, is of course, uh, true. I think the regions that are doing best on this, that are devoting own resources, local resources, passing bonds, actually devoting uh, 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 municipal revenues to it, are still woefully behind. Uh, I come from a, uh, a progressive metropolitan area, Minneapolis and St. Paul, we do a lot of things right. We have a, we have a, we have a deficit of almost 200,000 units of affordable housing. You know, we're, we're not going to make that up. We're not going to make that up in my lifetime. We're not going to make it up in any of these, probably. Um, the, uh, it, it will take a, a range. Uh, and, and so the question is, how close can we uh, and, and how much can we do? Understanding that we'll never uh, get to the, to, uh, to the full need. And it requires uh, all of the things uh, that, that um, you've talked about. Um, it, uh, some states, I, I can't uh, say what, uh, what, what Texas is like, but some states have very active housing finance agencies that uh, use, uh, use, use funds from uh, the state legislature uh, to do housing. They devote uh, local resources. There are what are called inclusionary housing uh, programs. I've got one, actually, uh, uh, where uh, when private developers are building market rate, they are required to set aside a certain portion for affordable housing. This ensures that whenever market rate housing is being built, some, some affordable housing is being built. Um, you know, there's a, there's, a, there's a toolbox of affordable housing options out there. We know how to do it. The, the technicalities of building it are not rocket science. It's not easy, but it's not rocket science. Uh, it's, it's, it is always, and in all cases, a question of political will. How much uh, of this type of housing will be accepted uh, by communities, uh, by uh, city councilmen, by city, uh, uh, by, uh, by legislatures, uh, and by neighbors. And so uh, the, uh, the fact that it costs a lot of money to build affordable housing, and the fact that it's not politically popular uh, is why we're so far behind uh, and why we fall uh, far behind. Uh, I, I will say that there are some Things that, uh, that the last part of my book talks about certain recommendations and, which are related to what, how to change what we're doing for public housing. And so I'll, I'll quickly uh, go through those. The first one 
is simply we need to stop tearing it down. I mean, if, if that commission identified 86,000 units of housing, uh, we've torn down three times that, right? and we're still tearing it down. I, uh, when I was writing this book, created for myself what's called a Google Alert. Every time uh, a searchable document hits the uh, uh, internet with the words public housing and demolition, I can leave it uh, and a link to the site. And I'm getting them every day. I'm getting these, these Google uh, uh, emails uh, certainly every week. Uh, we're still doing it. We're still doing it all over the country. So we have to stop tearing it down. Second, we need to phase in redevelopment. If we're gonna, if we're gonna redevelop and rehab a 300 unit uh, project, let's do 50 units over here, then, uh, then move to there so that, so that families can stay on site and move directly back into the units. This relates to the third recommendation, the right to remain. Uh, too many people uh, are experiencing what I call this double jeopardy. When finally we're fixing it up, they don't get the benefits of it. They're, they're, they're moved off. There needs to be provisions for the right to return, the right to remain in those units as they are improved. We need to reinstitute a meaningful one-for-one -one replacement. That is, if we find it absolutely necessary to tear down a unit, it needs to be replaced on a one-for-one basis. That used to be the law in the US. It used to be the law until the mid-90s when Congress eliminated it at the urging of Henry Cisneros. We need to preserve affordable housing in redevelopment areas. We're talking about a neighborhood here on the, uh, on the east side that is gentrifying, probably losing uh, affordable housing above and beyond public housing. We need to uh, preserve uh, that uh, housing you know, in whatever way possible. We need to do what I described earlier, which is, you know, if we really have the model for public housing now, let's start building more. The need is there. The waiting list exists in every city, uh, so let's build more. Finally, the last thing, uh, or two other things. Uh, I would monitor, I would institute uh, a, a we have environmental impact uh, statements and environmental impact reports in the U.S. We need racial impact uh, statements and racial impact reports. When we're going to do a redevelopment, and we're going to sink millions of dollars of public in, uh, subsidies in there. We need to find out what that's going to do uh, uh, in terms of having a racial uh, impact or not, or a disparate racial impact. And then finally, I think the last thing we're going to do is expand voluntary mobility programs. People who want to move out of these neighborhoods should be given the opportunity to move out of those neighborhoods. As soon as they move out, there's going to be a family that wants to move in. And if we can start uh, facilitating that process, that gets us a little bit away from the purpose. I want to first thank you for um, this powerful presentation. Um, and I, I just have a couple of things. One is, 
uh, there were uh, three quarter of a million dollar townhomes being built uh, on that uh, on that property across the street. Uh, the, the green green had even been torn down. This was, this was happening. So ripe was that area for reinvestment. In other places, it doesn't it doesn't take as much. Where public housing is sort of distant from the downtown or from amenities, where it's isolated, uh, and, and, and some public housing it has been built in sort of the outlying parts of, of neighborhoods, uh, cordoned off by railroads, highways, so that they're not locationally uh, advantaged, those neighborhoods tend to uh, not see a great deal of private sector investment or a great deal of change. There's a, there's, a, there's a real wide variation. And then in terms of the types of, of, uh, of businesses that come in, it's, uh, it, it, is, it is equally varied. It's, it's impossible to, to sort of, uh, characterize that in a, in, in a careful way. It depends on where the development is, what the microeconomics of that neighborhood uh, is, and then what kind of demographic changes were triggered by the I just wanted to ask a question as it relates to systems. The previous questioner asked about systems and you just talked about economic development. I'd like to know if your research showed any correlation between the school system and what happened during gentrification, redevelopment, did the schools close, did they improve? Can you speak to that? Sure, I, I really can't. I, I, I did not look at that question. I know anecdotally that in, in some places the impact on the, on the schools were quite significant uh, in terms of the loss of, of students uh, in some parts of Chicago uh, uh, and, and in other parts uh, of, of the country. Uh, there have been significant changes on the, on the student body. In some developments, new schools have been built for the new population uh, that, 
was achieved by the uh, residents of the Henry Horner homes on the west side of Chicago. They settled with the Housing Authority. They had a pretty good case of de facto demolition. And, uh, and so they talked the uh, Housing Authority into guaranteeing preservation of certain units, guaranteeing a right to remain or return for the residents. Um, but they didn't uh, save the units. Very much last question. Small question. Uh, what are your thoughts about the effectiveness of inclusionary housing, inclusionary laws? Do you think it's a model that should be perpetuated or not? In this I think every place should have it. I think that uh, I can't. I cannot think of a of a downside. Uh, an inclusionary housing uh, law is one that says if you're a developer and you're going to build 100 units of market rate, you either have to set aside 10 or 15 percent of them for uh, for affordability, or you get to build 10 or 15 more. That is, we'll give you a kind of a density bonus, but those have to be affordable. And uh, what's nice about that is that when the market is hot, when the housing units are being built, you're assured that uh, some of that are going to be affordable. Uh, furthermore, it doesn't take a lot of public subsidy to make that happen. Right? This is not something that uh, requires uh, uh, public uh, money uh, input. The downside of it is, you know, in housing markets like we've, like we've experienced for the last five years when nothing is being built, no affordable housing is being built either. Um, but uh, it, it, it's never going to be the only solution. There, there, we don't have a single solution. There is no silver bullet. Uh, what we need is all hands on deck, all ideas uh, working at, uh, at the same time. And that is a very good one that we should continue to pursue. Okay, that will wrap up the Q&A. Uh, please thank our speaker for uh, again.